All right, thank you so much for staying with Metropole Business Center. This is Tech Tuesday where we discuss matters of technology and innovations are sh uh, shaping Kenya's uh, tech space. All right, next we shall be looking into the best practices or rather best practices, best practices when it comes to good data governance and also helping us with an understanding and also get to understand the violations and the legal implications when it comes to defiling or violating data and joining us is uh, Ms. Motheu Kimulu who is a legal uh, specialist in cybersecurity, counterterrorism, crisis management, data privacy and AML law. Thank you so much for joining us uh, Motheu. It's a pleasure to be here Takaka. Great, quite a title you have there, but I'll just go by legal specialist uh, in data privacy. Yes. Or you can just go by with them. <laughs> All right, so Ms. Mudo, let us begin with an understanding of what good data governance is. We understand data. There is data, you know, in each and every aspect, uh, like each and every company wants to have data on their end and all that. But when it comes to governance, that's a whole, you know, lot, you know, totally different uh, subject or, or topic to handle there. So maybe we can start with defining what is data governance, Ms. Motheu. Okay, fine. Well, data governance basically is the planning, oversight, mm -hmm. and control over management of data, mm -hmm. and the use of data and mm -hmm. data-related sources. Uh-huh. Okay, great. So then now we come yeah. to how data governance is different from data management. In detail, you can expound this for our viewers. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Many people tend to uh, interuse or intermix the two terms, but basically data governance is just one part of the overall discipline of data management, mm -hmm. but it's an important one. Whereas data government is about roles, responsibilities, mm -hmm. and the processes for ensuring accountability and ownership of the data assets, data management is an overreaching term that describes the processes used to plan, specify, enable, create, acquire, maintain, use, archive, mm -hmm. retrieve, control, and purge data. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, then before we go into goals, what are some of the tools used uh, in collecting data? You can take us through that process and then we can come into the goals of data governance. Well, um, mm -hmm. when it goes into the tools, that would be more of a technical question than a legal yes. question. So <laughs> yes. I may not be best suited to answer that because uh -huh. I approach data privacy from a legal perspective, mm -hmm. but the tools would be whatever your IT department is recommending that you use, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not very conversant on that, mm -hmm. but I can tell you why Mm -hmm. why, why we need to have, um, what are the goals for data governance? Great. Um, because um, from that perspective, effective data government ensures that data is consistent and mm -hmm. trustworthy, mm -hmm. and it doesn't get misused, mm -hmm. thereby it protects and stores corporate data adequately. Because, mm -hmm. And this is because data is actually one of the most valuable items in an organization, mm -hmm. but it's also the, the most vulnerable more so with digital, digital transformation, mm -hmm. and uh, more and more people are embracing this. Mm -hmm. It's therefore becoming increasingly critical for organizations to have in place effective data governance, as organizations now also face uh, our data privacy laws and regulations, and they're also relying more and more on data analytics to help optimize operations and drive business decision making. Okay, great. Then we get to understand who typically makes up a data governance team. You know, take us through that, you know, slowly by slowly, you know, explain to our Njiko who does not understand data governance, who uh, typically makes up a data governance team, Mudeu. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. a data governance team will differ from enterprise to enterprise, but a well-designed data governance program typically mm -hmm. includes, one, your governance team, mm -hmm. and then a steering committee that acts as a governing body and a group of data stewards. And these people work together to create the standards and policies for governing data as well as the implementation and enforcement procedures that are primarily carried out by the data stewards. 
You also have executives mm -hmm. and other representations from an organization, business operations taking part in um, the data governance team, yeah. in addition to the organization's IT and data management teams. Mm -hmm. So that's basically who would uh, make up a Data governance, data governance team. team. Yeah. Okay, great. Then that will then bring us to our next point of understanding the importance of data governance. Oh, this is a very, very um, important area. Mm -hmm. And this is because the advantages of effective data government, governance include better, more comprehensive decision support, mm -hmm. stemming from consistent uniform data across the organization, mm -hmm. There's also, you also get clear rules for changing processes mm -hmm. and data that help businesses and IT infrastructure mm -hmm. become more agile and scalable. Mm -hmm. um, there's also reduced costs in other areas of data management mm -hmm. through the provision of central control mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, you also get increased efficiency mm -hmm. through the ability to reuse processes and data. Mm -hmm. And then there's improved confidence in data quality and the documentation and data processes. Mm -hmm. And finally, as a lawyer, I think the most important one in my book is improved mm -hmm. compliance and with data laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. And while this list does not in any way purport to be exhausted, this last point is very important in Kenya mm -hmm. as we have a very, very lax attitude towards data protection and privacy. Mm -hmm. For example, many times you enter a building and the guard will ask for your ID and your mobile number before allowing you to garner access. Uh -huh. And without a thought, you give them. The next thing, you either get threatening calls from malicious actors yeah. or receive marketing SMSs from mm -hmm. organizations you have never knowingly interacted with. Mm -hmm. Your data has been shared with others whom you don't know, mm -hmm. and most probably for a fee. And that's why there's a phrase that's commonly uh, being tossed around these days. Mm -hmm. Data is the new currency. Mm -hmm. However, this attitude is going to have to change very, very quickly mm -hmm. because in 2019, we enacted our Data Protection Act mm -hmm. and this was finally operationalized in the last quarter of last year mm -hmm. when we appointed our first data commissioner. Mm -hmm. Great. So, yeah. Yes, great, great. Now, um, so let's now come to DPA, Data Protection Act. Yeah? Uh, maybe we can start mm -hmm. by understanding who are the data subjects, data controllers, as well as the data processors. You know, step by step, uh, elaborate that for us. Okay. Who are these people? Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Well, the Data Protection Act now um, makes uh, securing data in Kenya uh -huh. now a legal requirement. And so a violation of this Data Protection Act mm -hmm. will leave you and your business liable to hefty penalties and the thing that shocks most people is that you can even go to prison for up to 10 years. And this is because the DPA seeks to protect the rights of, as you've mentioned, data subjects, mm -hmm. controllers, and processors. So a data subject mm -hmm. um, has been is an identified or identifiable natural person mm -hmm. um, who is the subject of a personal data, basically you and me. Mm -hmm. um, a data controller has also been defined as a natural or legal person, mm -hmm. a public authority, an agency, or other body which alone or jointly with others mm -hmm. determines the purpose and means of processing the data. Mm -hmm. So for example, like Metropole TV is collecting data. Mm -hmm. They are the ones now who could be called the data controller for whatever you're garnering. Uh -huh. And then finally, we have a data processor. As a natural or legal person, a mm -hmm. public authority, an agency, or other body which processes personal data mm -hmm. on behalf of the data controller. Mm -hmm. So if Metropol gives that, that information maybe to another organization, mm -hmm. they are now the processor. Mm -hmm. And um, what's also very um, interesting is that the under Section 4 of our Data Protection Act, it mm -hmm. clarifies that a data controller and or a data processor, mm -hmm. they don't need to be established or ordinarily resident in Kenya to okay. fall under the provisions of this act. Mm -hmm. So long as you're processing the personal data mm -hmm. uh, of data subjects located in Kenya, mm -hmm. which shows that just because you're located outside Kenya, mm -hmm. you can't escape the reach of the DPA mm -hmm. as regards Kenyan-based data subjects. Uh -huh. So those with access to a person's personal data mm -hmm. have a duty of care to maintain it mm -hmm. and to protect it uh, because our privacy rights 
were first enshrined in our constitution and are now further protected by our Data Protection Act. Mm -hmm. Great, and protection is very important. Then now, one might want to ask, what is a personal breach of data under the DPA? Maybe you can expound this for us, Ms. Moteu. Okay. Mm. Okay, so a personal data bre uh, breach mm -hmm. is defined as a breach of security mm -hmm. uh, leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, mm -hmm. loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or mm. access to personal data which is either transmitted stored or otherwise processed mm -hmm. so basically for example um if i've given you my information and a cyber criminal hacks your system mm -hmm. that even if it wasn't intentional it was accidentally hacked because there was a a lag in your system, mm -hmm. but somebody has gained unlawful access to my data, mm -hmm. that is a personal data breach. Uh -huh. And so this is why the, D the, the Data Protection Act now requires all organizations mm -hmm. um, to have a data protection officer in place, mm -hmm. uh, which is why you're finding many co um, corporates are now beginning to have these positions. Mm -hmm. And because this data protection officer is somebody with relevant academic and professional qualification, uh, which may include technical skills mm -hmm. to help you better secure your data because mm -hmm. you don't want to be found uh, liable of a breach. Mm -hmm. Great. And now that will bring me to a uh, prompt, uh, you know, the question, does now the DPA set out any standards as regards the protection of data? Yes. Um, in fact, if you, if anybody was to go into Section 25 of the Data Protection Act, it actually in detail lists out principles and standards that um, people and organizations must adhere to. Uh -huh. And these include the fact that the data has to be processed mm -hmm. in accordance with the right to privacy of the data subject. Mm -hmm. And this process must be lawful, mm -hmm. fairly, fairly done in a transparent manner. Mm -hmm. Which means, for example, if you're a bank or a company holds your data, mm -hmm. they have to be transparent about what they hold. The Data Protection Act actually gives you a right to go and ask them what information do you have of me. Uh -huh. Are our organizations ready for us to come and ask them for that data? Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that people now, businesses now need to start thinking about. Mm -hmm. Also, some of the protections is that the data has to be collected for explicit and specified reasons, uh -huh. which is why, like in the example of the guard who you give your information to at the entrance of the building, mm -hmm. if that information it is leaked out to other people, you can actually sue the building management or the mm -hmm. owner of that building. Yeah. Because um, you haven't consented to it being given to anybody else. Your consent was just mm -hmm. for me to be able to enter. Mm -hmm. Then other things is that it has to be basically limited to basically what they're collecting it for. Mm. Um, it also, you, you also have to write that once they stop, once they, once mm -hmm. the need for which that information was required is no longer there, uh -huh. um, they shouldn't hold on to it. You actually even have a right for you to ask for your information mm -hmm. to be erased or rectified if there's a discrepancy in it, you know? And yeah. these are things that people are not really fully cognizant about. Mm -hmm. And then another interesting factor is that it cannot be transferred outside Kenya. Mm -hmm. Unless there is proof of adequate data protection safeguards in the jurisdiction it's going to, mm -hmm. and you, the data subject, have consented to that transfer. Mm -hmm. So foreign multinationals who are currently earning billions of dollars from unconsented data mining in Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, from Kenyan-based data subjects, uh -huh. can, may soon be liable for violations under our Data Protection Act. Wow. And this has happened in Europe, you know, with the GDPR and many big companies, Google's or Facebook's being hit with fines. Wow, wow, yeah. that's quite, you know, that's quite a lot to know now because I, I wouldn't want my data or my information to be out there in the public without my consent. And I'm glad that you put out uh, uh, that well very clearly. But now how can organizations adopt a data, data privacy and protection policies just to ensure that they are fully compliant with the DPA? 
Okay. Mm. Um, the best the best way to do this is yeah. for them to create an inventory mm-hmm. of data processes and then their life cycle. Mm-hmm. And then you also need to evaluate the existing data processing systems uh-huh. to establish uh, the extent to which or not they meet the, the mm. key principles. That's consent, purpose, data minimization, and data mm-hmm. storage. Yeah. And then you need to also make sure that you keep on doing undertaking data protection impact assessments. Mm-hmm. And then make sure you have a data protection officer in place. It's a requirement under the DPA, and they mm-hmm. can focus on these kind of things. Mm-hmm. And then you also need to take notes on the clause in the Data Protection Act uh-huh. on automated processing and mm-hmm. data transfers, uh-huh. just to make sure you're compliant. Yeah. And finally, uh-huh. I would also, I mean, while not being exhaustive, mm-hmm. I would say take note of the breach notification. Mm-hmm. You have to notify the relevant authorities within 72 hours. Mm-hmm. And just to give you an idea how this may seem within 72 hours, that isn't so hard. Mm-hmm. But an IBM report, the IBM um, World Breach Report from yeah. 2020, uh-huh. shows that, for example, a financial institution, mm-hmm. it takes about 170 days mm-hmm. to first of all discover a breach, mm-hmm. and then another 70 days to contain it. Mm-hmm. And yet the cost on the global stage of, of, of each financial breach mm-hmm. is over $5.85 million. Mm-hmm. So if you're being told to notify within 72 hours, it doesn't mean you discovered that that breach has been in existence for 72 hours. Mm-hmm. If you're a financial institution, it could have been there for 170 days. Uh-huh. Can you imagine what harm has been done to your system during that period? Oh. So mm. data governance and data management needs to be taken very, mm. very seriously. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'll skip the cyber breaches part because you have expounded on that, but you can, uh, you know, combine it with the next one where we have seen a rise in cyber breaches uh, mm-hmm. which have been enhanced by remote working and uh, how can a business optimize security while remote working very briefly? Okay, fine. Well, mm-hmm. cyber breaches last year in Kenya went up by almost 50%. Mm-hmm. And this is mainly because many of us are remote working and some of us are still remote working. Uh-huh. So um, the, some of the ways we can optimize security while we're remote working mm-hmm. is ensure you secure your endpoint security. Uh-huh. Ensure all your sensitive files are encrypted. Mm-hmm. Use multi-factor authentications. Shut down or time out your laptops when not in use, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, because you never know who's going to pass by and see what critical information you have on your screen. Mm-hmm. Don't access public free Wi-Fi spots. Many people mm-hmm. want to go to the coffee house and access the free Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. You don't know. I mean, these free Wi-Fi is where the cyber criminals prowl. And you don't know also who's seeing your information. Mm-hmm. Turn off your smart devices, you know, yeah. um, when you're having confidential meetings. There was mm-hmm. even a case of a casino in the U.S., which was hacked through a fish tank mm. uh, thermometer. Mm-hmm. And then don't mix your work and personal devices. You know, keep them separate. Because yes. you don't know that game you or your kids are downloading mm-hmm. if it has malware and the mm-hmm. cyber criminal could get access to your organization's networks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. So as we wrap up, Ms. Muteu, how are our courts addressing data protection violations and also your other thoughts as we wrap up quickly? Um, okay, well, our courts haven't yet really, because like I said, our Data Protection Act was only operationalized last year when we appointed our data commissioner, mm-hmm. and she's busy setting up the office, and although she's issued regulations. Mm-hmm. However, Kenya um, relies on English precedent mm-hmm. as very persuasive in our courts. Mm-hmm. And last year, the UK Supreme Court ruled that Uber drivers are essentially mm-hmm. um, Uber employees when you download the app. Now, bringing that back home, mm-hmm. who knows? Does it mean that anybody who downloads the M-Pesa app because um, Safaricom holds the intellectual property rights to that will be deemed an employee? Mm-hmm. So all these agencies where you go and you're giving your information, your ID and your mobile number to deposit mm-hmm. or withdraw money, if mm-hmm. they illegally give out their money, are the courts going to rule that Safaricom is vicariously liable? Mm-hmm. I mean, these are questions we don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see how our courts are, are going to approach that. Mm-hmm. In the UK, like I say, where we rely on for persuasive precedent, mm-hmm. there was another case of Morrison's, 
where the company was held to be vicariously liable yeah. for a data breach caused by a rogue employee. Mm. So interesting times lie ahead. All I can say is take data protection very securely. It has mm. to um, sit at the forefront of your corporate boardroom mm. um, because you don't want to be hit with a fine, nor do you want to go to jail. Great, so. great, great. I agree. Quite interesting times lie ahead of us. Thank you so much, Ms. Modeu. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. All right. So that has been Miss Muthew helping us discuss importance or best practices when it comes to good data governance. All right. That's it for this particular segment or part. For now, we take a very short commercial break, but stay tuned because there's still a lot more coming up your way.